Hey, good evening. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Gotti Schwartz coming to you from Los Angeles. And here are the stories we're watching tonight, starting with 13, count them, 13 Republican presidential candidates all on one stage tonight in Iowa. And the front runner, Donald Trump, is there as well. Now the question is, will any of his opponents bring up the new federal charges that were just brought against him? And remember the Alabama woman who reported a toddler on a freeway, then went missing, then turned out she had faked that abduction? Well, she's been charged and arrested. Her decisions that night created panic and alarm for the citizens of our city and even across the nation as the concern grew that a kidnapper was on the loose using a small child as bait. And there is a red meat allergy being linked to tick bites, and the CDC estimates that nearly a half a million Americans could be affected. And NBC's Craig Melvin travels to Atlanta to investigate the controversial $90 million police training facility the critics call Cop City. After a shootout near Cop City left a protester dead and a Georgia State Patrol trooper wounded. The men well died for this. Yeah. Was it worth it? We will see. And tonight, all Republican eyes are on Iowa as the already crowded GOP field of presidential candidates shares the same stage. There are 13, including former President Donald Trump, and all of them with the same goal, except for Donald Trump, and that is to cut into his massive lead. Tonight's event started about an hour ago, and we've heard from a few candidates so far. Most of them are not talking about the elephant in the room, Trump's latest indictment, but hitting hard on the Biden administration instead. Biden has proven to be incredibly weak, and Kamala is not up for the job. Let's elect a president who will bring out the best of America, the goodness of America. Our country is in decline, and Joe Biden is the custodian of that decline. I'm running for president because we as Republicans cannot be content with simply managing the decline of our country a little bit better. And Trump himself is going to take the stage in just about an hour, just a day after being charged with more federal crimes in the classified documents case. We're going to get into that in just a bit. But first, NBC's Gabe Gutierrez has more from Iowa. The potential Trump indictment looming large over the Lincoln dinner tonight here in Iowa, where 13 presidential hopefuls will take the stage, basically everyone except Chris Christie. And the event will mark the first time that former President Trump and Florida Governor Ron DeSantis will be at the same event here in Iowa, this crucial early voting state. And while President, former President Trump is still enjoying a massive lead here in the polls, Governor DeSantis is trying to reset his campaign and trying to gain some ground. We spoke with some of his supporters at one of his events last night. Take a listen to what they had to say. I voted for Trump and I support him 100 percent. But now you think but, perhaps DeSantis? Yeah, just because I don't know that it's Trump's fault that he's got so much baggage, mm -hmm. but because the Democrats just present too much baggage for him. Meanwhile, Governor DeSantis is facing criticism from one of his other GOP rivals, Senator Tim Scott, who is blasting him over those controversial African-American teaching standards that were just adopted by the state of Florida. The governor has said that any criticism of the standards, which includes a portion that talks about potential benefits that uh, slaves got while they were in captivity, the governor said that that was taken out of context, that overall the standards are robust. But last night, Senator Tim Scott said that there is no silver lining to slavery. Joining other Republicans, including Congressman Byron Donalds and Vice President Kamala Harris, in attacking Governor DeSantis. Again, his campaign pushing back on that. But that issue, plus the issue of the looming Trump indictment, again, looming large here in Iowa. Thanks, Gabe. Now turning from the political to the legal, last night we saw that new superseding indictment drop in the classified documents case, charging Trump with more federal counts. The Fed's also deciding to go after a Mar-a-Lago maintenance worker, Carlos de Oliveira, in an alleged plot to delete security camera footage at the direction of, quote, the boss. Now today, Trump saying those tapes were his and he didn't think he had to turn them in. These were my tapes that we gave to them. 
and they basically then say that's not enough. We didn't, I don't think we would have had a given. I'm not sure that we would have even had a given if these were security tapes. We handed them over to them. I don't. I doubt we would have if we wanted to fight that. I doubt we would have had a given. But regardless, we gave it. Now, all this coming as special counsel Jack Smith is gearing up to hand down a third indictment against the former president very soon on a whole different investigation. NBC's Garrett Haake, who covers the Trump campaign, joins us now. Garrett, uh, any update on that third indictment and, and what the latest is there? Yeah, hey, Gotti, remember that other case? We all thought we'd see major news on that yesterday afternoon. That's why we stationed ourselves outside this federal courthouse yesterday. Been here off and on ever since then. Look, here's what we know. The grand jury was in yesterday for about seven hours. That's far longer than usual, suggesting that perhaps there was something important going on behind those closed doors. But it's a secret process. We can never say for sure. What we can say is that Donald Trump's lawyers also met with the special counsel yesterday to talk about that possibility of another indictment related to the election interference case. What came out of that is a little bit in dispute, but the upshot is nothing happened in that meeting to change the trajectory that they were already on, which is Donald Trump got a target letter more than a week ago. That's the kind of thing that almost certainly ends in an indictment, and nothing that was said behind those closed doors has changed that. So looking ahead to next week, grand jury's typically back on Tuesdays and Thursdays. That's when we might get a real substantive update on this. Until then, we're left to wait and wonder exactly what the special counsel knows and when they're ready to try to prove it with an indictment. We will wait and see. Now, now switching back to the new charges that we saw yesterday, what else have we learned uh, that we didn't know yesterday? I, I think we now know the name of a, a, another employee. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. A man named Yusil Tavares, who's employee number four, for those of you scoring at home, reading the indictment along with us, he seems to be cooperating with the special counsel, at least to some degree. They've got a lot of information in this indictment that could probably only have come from either his phone or his testimony. We really don't know that for sure, but we are seeing what appears to be evidence of, uh, you know, Carlos de Oliveira, who's, you know, questioned about his loyalty and this new indictment, appearing to stay loyal to the former president. There's indications that his legal bills might be getting paid by the former president's PAC. That includes donations, by the way, from regular supporters. Uh, so we're watching that closely. And I think we're also seeing the former president politically just continue to lean into this. There's nothing different about his approach to new charges, you know, going up to 40 charges in this case from 37. He's making the case that it's political, and he's trying to make the fact that he's being targeted he and not any other candidate on the Republican side, a sign that somehow he's the strongest person to face off against Joe Biden next fall. We'll see if Republican uh, voters buy that, but so far, the polling, the fundraising numbers, every metric that we track indicates they do. Garrett Hake, thanks so much. Now, is there such a thing as being too old to serve in office? They've got minimum ages. Should they have a maximum one as well? It's, a, it's an age-old question that has taken center stage this week after Senator Mitch McConnell froze mid-sentence during a press conference and Senator Dianne Feinstein got confused during a vote and seemed like she was coached to just say, I, NBC's Peter Alexander has more. For America's lawmakers, seniority has long meant power and prestige, but now it might also be a political liability. Today, the Senate's longest-serving leader, Republican Mitch McConnell's office, insists he intends to serve out his term, days and after the 81-year-old uh, froze uh, mid-sentence. McConnell, a childhood polio survivor, has suffered a series of recent falls, cracking a rib and suffering a concussion. Got to watch those sandbags. <laughs> but he joked about this week's episode hours later as Republicans stand by him. Mitch is strong, he's stubborn as a mule. He's not the oldest in office. 90-year-old Democrat Dianne Feinstein, who some members of her own party have urged to resign, appeared confused during a committee meeting yesterday, starting to give a speech when she was only supposed to vote on a bill. Submitted. Yeah, just say aye. Okay. Feinstein's office later saying the situation was a little chaotic and that the senator was preoccupied. The 118th Congress is the third oldest since 1789. President Biden's age is already a key issue ahead of 2024, stumbling on steps, tripping over a sandbag, adding to the scrutiny. The president's increasingly trying to diffuse any criticism about his age. Think about it. I know I'm 198 years old. <laughs> Already America's oldest president, at the end of a second term, Joe Biden will have just turned 86. The Republican frontrunner, Donald Trump, would be 82. 
A recent NBC News poll found more than two-thirds of all voters say they have concerns about the president having the necessary mental and physical health to serve. 55% say the same about former President Trump. When you look at how much a president ages in just four years, um, and they're already at that age, what's that leave us with? Pete Alexander, thanks so much. And turning now to Alabama, where the woman who police say lied about being kidnapped has been arrested. Now, not only did she spark a desperate search after she called 911, but also a search for a toddler that didn't exist. And police said today that Carly Russell is facing two charges and could face prison time. Her decisions that night created panic and alarm for the citizens of our city and even across the nation as the concern grew that a kidnapper was on the loose using a small child as bait. NBC's correspondent Priscilla Thompson has that story. Well, Carly Russell was arrested and charged today for falsely reporting to law enforcement and falsely reporting an incident. Both of those, as you mentioned, are Class A misdemeanors, so they are going to each carry up to a year in prison and potentially a $6,000 fine per offense. And we saw that she was arrested earlier today. There was a mugshot that was released. She has since bonded out. But what police are saying is that uh, this has wreaked havoc in this community for families who have experienced something like this and who are real victims. It has opened wounds for them, and it has also been a waste of resources and time that went into trying to find her. And so the message they're hoping to send with these charges is that actions have consequences, but they also acknowledge that these are only misdemeanors, and they say that that's because that's all that the law allows for in this case. I want to play a little bit of what officials had to say about that. I know many are shocked and appalled that Ms. Russell is only being charged with two misdemeanors, despite all the panic and disruption her actions caused. Let me assure you, I too share the same frustration, but existing laws only allow the charges that were filed to be filed. And Russell's attorney says that while these charges are misdemeanors, that Carly Russell does understand the significance of them and is taking them very seriously. And we also heard the attorney general saying that he does intend to prosecute her to the full extent of the law and that as this investigation continues, if there are opportunities for more charges to be filed, that he will certainly pursue that. But the larger issue that a lot of people are talking about in the wake of all of this is the kind of attention that is given to missing black women and women and people of color. We know that nearly 40 percent of the people who are missing in this country are people of color. And so what some people fear is that this will prevent them from getting that same level of media attention that could help bring them home because of this hoax. But there are others who are saying, no, this is an example of what should happen and what should be allowed for all of those other missing folks who are out there in the hopes that that additional attention could could help bring them home. Gotti. NBC's Priscilla Thompson, thanks so much. Now, thousands of Americans are ditching red meat and not by choice. It's because of ticks making them allergic. Dr. Sayal is here to explain what's going on. Coming up next. Hey there, welcome back. And here are some of the other headlines we're watching tonight. Suspected Idaho killer Brian Koberger's lawyer wants a judge to throw out his indictment. A grand jury charged him in connection with the quadruple stabbing near the University of Idaho. His legal team says that the jury was misled. Now, Kohlberger has pled not guilty to all murder charges. And the Hollywood strike is pushing back award season. The 75th annual Emmy Awards have been delayed because of the massive writers and actors strikes. And we don't know when they're going to happen. Now, one reason for the strikes is the residual checks people get from those streaming shows. Take a look. I want to give you an example of what a residual check looks like. I showed this to my brother and he fell on the floor laughing. It ain't funny. That's your residual check. 
And President Biden is signing an executive order that changes how armed forces handle sexual assault, domestic violence, and murder cases. Up until now, commanders had played a big role in each case. Now, independent military prosecutors are going to handle them. And Bronny James, the son of NBA legend LeBron James, has been released from the hospital. He suffered cardiac arrest on the basketball court during practice on Monday. So far, there is no word yet if he's going to be back on the court anytime soon. But James is an incoming freshman at USC. And a Florida woman is going to prison for four years because she scammed a Holocaust survivor she met on a dating site. She stole over $2.8 million from the 87-year-old victim. And with that money, she bought a home in a gated community, a Rolex, and a bunch of jewelry. And that record-breaking heat in Arizona is even too hot for the state's iconic saguaro cacti. You heard that right? It is too hot right now for a cactus of all things, not so much because parts of the states have hit uh, at least 110 degrees pretty much every day of July, but more because the temperatures at night aren't dropping below 90. And like people, that's when a cactus needs to cool off. And that's the same thing for cactus. At a certain temperature for a certain length of time, they just can't do it anymore. And that heat wave has also moved to the Midwest and Northeast, where tens of millions are doing their best to stay cool. It's got so many people right now calling up AC repair shops to fix those coolers. I was kind of worried if I'd be able to get anybody out today because it's I'm sure all the air conditioners are going down, or a lot of them are, and um, being able to get somebody out quick is, is tough. The worst kind of day to wait. Now, this heat is serious business, but there are ways to beat it. And joining us now, where it looks like it's still suns out, guns out in Philadelphia, is NBC News <laughs> correspondent George Solis. Uh, George, seems like you've got the right idea. Seems like the people behind you have the right idea. A pool to cool off in, huh? Yeah, that's right, Gotti. We're here at the John B. Kelly Pool in Philadelphia. Lunch, or excuse me, dinner hour at this point. So a lot of people are heading out. But let me tell you, this pool was full all day today. A lot of people taking that advice from the experts to finding a cool place to beat this heat. The cooling centers were open today. The spray grounds were also open today. Here in Philadelphia, 50 or so plus pools that were open with lifeguards to man them. That is so important here. The job that they are doing, making sure that these kids stay safe. There was actually a little concern, right, a little earlier when there was talk of a lifeguard shortage. Uh-uh, not here in the city of Philadelphia. The city actually putting out a bonus for the first time ever to ensure they had adequate staffing so people could enjoy a pool on a day like today. And let me tell you, this has been the place to be for me. I have been enjoying every second of this. You know, we often talk about, hey, we're going to want to get in the water when we're doing these types of reports. I said, you know what, if you can't beat them, join them. But I do want to leave you with a little bit from our conversation with a Parks and Rec official about the importance of lifeguards. Take a listen. And so what I'm seeing here is obviously as the day goes on, people will probably line up here as they usually do yes, to get into do. the pool. I see six lifeguard stands. These are all going to be manned today. Yeah, they'll all be manned. Um, you know, hopefully, you know, the, the crowd won't be terrible, so we don't have to run lines, which means, like, you know, do rotations every hour. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we get six lifeguards. It's 180 in the pool. It makes us feel really good. Yeah, Gotti, with so many pools here in the city of Philadelphia, the lifeguards, obviously, of critical importance. <laughs> Lifeguards of critical importance. I mean, that yesterday I was worried about you in the heat. Today I am so jealous. I hope you do a cannonball right after this. Uh, I, I do want to talk a little bit about the way the city of Philadelphia is, is built. How are heat domes factoring into the heat wave that Philadelphia has seen right now? Yeah, it's actually a good point to bring up, Gotti, because not just Philadelphia, but a lot of major cities, of course, we know don't have the adequate tree canopies because we have skyscrapers everywhere. And what we're finding is that a lot of these places are actually hotter than what we've actually been reporting because, again, there is no tree cover there. So a lot of cities are being proactive here in Philadelphia. There's actually a plan in place to put more trees up because... Frankly, that is the best shade. It works as a natural air conditioning. And here in Philadelphia, they're actually waiting, awaiting some grant money that will hopefully come down fairly soon where they'll be able to plant a lot more trees. And here's my conversation with an official about that. Take a listen. We know that um, some neighborhoods of the city can be up to 22 degrees hotter than other neighborhoods. And tree canopy has a lot to do with that. So we want to make sure everyone has access to the resource of trees. So more trees, more lifeguards, a lot of pool time. 
Hey, sun setting here on the East Coast, but you know what? I'm just gonna hang out here a little bit longer because we know this heat wave is not quite done yet, so I'm gonna take in all the pool time I can. Gotti? Yeah, I'll pull all to yourself, and now that the camera's gonna turn away, I hope you take your shirt off. I mean, I know it's sweltering out there. <laughs> <laughs> Will do. All right, George, give the people what they want. Okay, turning now to grilling season in full swing. This is gonna be a tough story for a lot of meat eaters to swallow. The CDC is issuing a warning about a meat allergy that's becoming a lot more common, so much so that it is the 10th most common food allergy right now in the United States. We are talking about alpha-gal syndrome. It's caused by these little ticks right there, specifically the Lone Star Tick. And according to the CDC, there have been about 110,000 cases since 2010, but the number of people likely infected overall is probably a lot higher, closer to 450,000, because a lot of those cases are never diagnosed. NBC News medical fellow Dr. Akshay Sayal joins us now. Uh, Dr. Sayal, if you love meat and you are wondering, wait, sometimes I don't feel that great after I eat meat, how do you know if you have this or not? Yeah, hey, Gaddy. So it's, it's a great question, actually. So what alpha-gal syndrome is, it's, a, it's an allergy to a sugar that's commonly found in mammalian meat in things like, like lamb chops or, or, or steak. Um, and, you know, unlike normal allergies to food like shellfish or peanuts, for example, you know, people tend to have symptoms pretty quickly. With this one, it can take about two to six hours to see things like nausea, stomach cramps, uh, diarrhea, and, and, and hives or itchy rash like you see with a lot of other allergies. But, Gaddy, the big one here and the reason this can be so serious, the shortness of breath, including anaphylaxis, basically your throat sort of closes mm. up after you get exposed and that can cause, you know, it, it's, it's when you see people get stabbed with an EpiPen, that's what they're referring to is, is that sort of airway closing and the throat closing and, and causing breathing problems. And that's why, you know, it, it can be really, really serious and why I'm glad the CDC is putting on alert here uh, this week, Gotti. Terrifying. And, and if you think you have this, what should you do? If you have like a, a couple of those symptoms, maybe not all of them, do you immediately call a doctor? Is this, is this that serious? Yeah, and you know, that's what's so interesting about this. In, in part of this report, about half of doctors haven't even heard of this thing. I mean, it sounds almost like science fiction, right? You're allergic to, to red meat or to mammalian meat. Um, and so if you think you have this, the good news, Scotty, for those watching, you, there's actually a blood test out there. It's, it's not something that's terribly hard to diagnose if you do suspect it. I mean, so for your patients out there, for your viewers out there who are thinking, you know, I don't feel so good after having red meat, like you said, um, make a diary. You know, after the next time you go to In-N-Out Burger, make, make a diary of what your symptoms are like afterwards are you having that belly pain are you having the nausea and start to sort of make a journal and take it to your doctor and mention this bring this report to them and it's it's fortunately something that's very very easy to test for you just have to know to test for it it's so crazy to think that so many doctors don't know about this that's why you are our doctor um so if this is actually super underdiagnosed, how did scientists even figure out what was going on yeah, it's, it's a great story, actually. So what, what certain scientists noticed was that there was a cancer drug that certain patients were actually getting a bad reaction to. And a lot of the patients who were getting a bad reaction actually lived in a certain parts of the country where these, where these ticks were popping up. Um, and so one of the doctors actually got his hands dirty. He went hiking. He ended up getting bit by a tick. And lo and behold, he had an, a reaction to lamp chops. He actually had the symptoms that we just wow. talked about himself. Um, and so, you know, running some more lab tests, they were able to actually figure this out. And we're so glad they did because as more and more awareness pops up, more and more people can have an explanation for their symptoms. It's not all in your head, and it's something that we fortunately can test for so easily today. But lamb chops, too? I mean, this is, uh, is going to be bumming a and, lot of people out. And, and some good news here, Gotti. It does seem, if you avoid red meat for a little bit, it does seem to go away in a few years. That's the best part, <laughs> Dr. Akshay Sayal. Thank you so very much. Anytime. And coming up, a closer look inside Atlanta's so-called Cop City and why it's caused nearly two years of protests there. But first, uh, you got to see this. A bank robber in Iowa uh, or Ohio trying to get through the drive through ceiling. First, he drops a bag of construction tools. Then he falls. Wait for it. Oh, what? There he is. There's his leg. Oh. He falls right into the most perfectly positioned trash can ever, a recycling, all making it super easy for police to catch him. That's what you get when your escape plan is trash, bro. We'll be right back.
Hey there, welcome back. Let's get you caught up in 30 seconds. Nearly the entire Republican field, minus Chris Christie, is in Iowa right now for a fundraising dinner, and Donald Trump is there too as more legal trouble for him keeps piling up. And the Alabama woman who lied about being kidnapped is now being charged. Carly Lee Russell is facing up to two years in jail if convicted. And nearly 160 million Americans are under heat alerts today, and it is so hot in Arizona right now that even cacti are struggling. Can a juvenile be sentenced to life in prison without parole? That's what a judge is trying to decide in the case of Ethan Crumbly, who shot and killed four of his classmates at Oxford High School two years ago when he was 15 years old. Now, the last two days in the courtroom have been filled with new revelations about the shooting and deeply emotional testimonies from teachers and old classmates. We're going to play one for you, but a warning, what you're about to hear is disturbing. I rolled the student over, and it was Tate Muir. And how did you know Tate? I had Tate and his brothers from elementary school all the way through high school. I've known Tate since he was about three. I could see that the bullet had exited through his eye. So when I put my hand down on the ground, I put my hand in what would have been his, his eyeball. And she was talking about Tate Muir there, one of the four students who lost their lives at Oxford High that day. Seven other students were also hurt. NBC's Maggie Vespa joins us now. She's been following this. Maggie, can you walk us through some of those new revelations that we heard today? And, and how is the prosecutor's argument shaping up so far? Yeah, so the prosecution got is kind of leaning on it, perhaps no surprise, really graphic, really emotional evidence uh, and testimony like you heard there. Uh, basically, we've heard from an assistant principal, you saw that. We've heard from a teacher who was shot in this shooting. We've heard from police who, who arrived on scene and said they, what they weren't prepared for was to have to run past wounded students to try and stop a shooter on a deadly rampage. Remember, we, again, four were killed, seven were injured on top of that. Today, this was day two, the big headline was we actually heard from kids who were in the school who survived the shooting, two of them taking the stand. I want to point out, you're about to hear sound from two of those students. You will hear their voice. You will not see their faces, and we will not name them. That is per the court's instruction. Take a listen. I just prayed, and I covered my head, because I, I didn't know if those were my last moments. Because I think when I saw his body, I realized that if I stayed, I was going to die. That second student there talking about how he says Ethan Crumley, the, the now teenage boy, 17-year-old boy who has pleaded guilty in this attack, uh, found him and another student, Justin Schilling, inside a bathroom, demanded Justin come outside. And then he says Ethan shot Justin at point-blank range. That's a lot of what the prosecution is focusing on, that they say a lot of this was really cold, really calculated. I get a lot of shooting students um, from just inches away from them, walking through the school. They say he was often posturing, seemed really proud of what he was doing. Ethan Crumley uh, pleaded guilty to four counts of first-degree murder and one unusual count of terrorism causing death. And so what we're talking about now is he will serve life in prison, Gotti, but what they're debating is should he have the chance at parole. Per a U.S. Supreme Court case, this kind of hearing is required if it's a minor to determine whether parole should be an option eventually. Basically, can this minor be rehabilitated? So that's what we're debating here in this hearing. Now, I know the courtroom was filled with family members of the victims, but I understand that the gunman's yeah. family was not there, his parents in particular. Uh, why not? So basically, another judge, uh, unrelated to this specific case, declined their request to be in the courtroom. That's James and Jennifer Crumley there, parents of Ethan, in the middle. They famously are facing charges of their own tied to this shooting. Each is charged with involuntary manslaughter for investigators and prosecutors say giving their son a gun as an early Christmas present, basically right before this shooting, and in doing so, prosecutors say, ignoring signs, very clear signs, they say, that their son was on 
unstable, that he had tendencies toward violence, that basically he was not someone who should have access to a weapon. Uh, so basically, again, his parents not in the courtroom. That is a separate case. They have pleaded not guilty to those charges, and we reached out. They got back to us with no comment. But we have seen a lot of evidence in this hearing specific to Ethan, his journal entries saying that he wanted to commit an act like this, saying that he had an affinity for torturing small animals, saying that he had asked for help, for mental health help, and he hadn't gotten it. So kind of elements of that likely to come up potentially in the parents' case as well. But no, they are not in court, and they are still facing that legal battle of their own. Gotti. Horrifying case. Maggie Vespa, thanks so much. And just north of Atlanta, Georgia, the so-called Cop City, a massive controversial training facility, is moving forward, but with a lot of resistance. After a federal ruling yesterday, a group challenging the sprawling $90 million law enforcement training complex now has until September to collect enough signatures to force a vote on its construction. The site, technically part of DeKalb County, has been the source of controversy for months with large protests, police raids, violence, and at least one deadly shootout that left a protester dead. I don't want a cop city. Manuel didn't want it, and I don't want it either. Your man well died for this. Yeah. Was it worth it? We will see. That's NBC's Craig Melvin, who tra traveled to Atlanta to talk with city leaders supporting Cop City and the activists who were fighting against it. Here's that story from Georgia. This 300-acre section of city-owned land in the South River Forest is one of Atlanta's largest remaining green spaces. It's also now at the center of the national debate over policing in this country. In March of 2021, city leaders propose a new 85-acre, $90 million training center for police and firefighters. Almost immediately, opponents start calling it Cop City. Instant backlash. Stop Cop City! For some, Stop Cop City becomes this, this sort of rallying cry. Protesters argue that destroying parts of the forest would hurt the community. They also fear the facility will help further militarize the police. Why do you think it's in your neck of the woods? Environmental racism racialized capitalism, and the fact that those people who live there cannot vote against it. The police training facility would be built in predominantly black and middle class DeKalb County. But since DeKalb residents aren't technically part of Atlanta, they don't have any representation on city council. The intersectionality of this movement cannot be denied. It affects us all. You have people who care about the environment. You have people who believe that Cop City would exacerbate all of the issues that are negative in community. All kinds of people, black, white, trans, indigenous people. Now, this is the training facility Atlanta police had been using until 2021. A former elementary school built in the 1950s, now condemned. Evidence of the building's past lives? Everywhere. Atlanta Police Chief Darren Shirebaum showed us around. And so we have to, as a profession, continue to evolve to be good at what we do and to be trusted by the community. And if we're not providing the proper training facilities and programming, uh, then we're going to fail in one or both of those areas. The project's official website claims the goal is to provide modern equipment and more socially just models of policing. The planned facility will include modern classrooms, a new shooting range, even a mock city. We're talking about fake apartment buildings, a nightclub, and gas stations as well. Settings where officers can practice de-escalation and other crisis intervention techniques. Not just law enforcement, but firefighters and emergency medical responders will also train here. Well, what do you make of the public outcry so far, the, the criticisms? So the thing that really strikes home for me is, are we militarizing our police? So that is a national point of concern. And I can say this as a chief of police, I will never uh, lead a militarized police department. What I have to do is lead a group of men and women that are ready to counter any emergency that will arise in the streets of Atlanta, Georgia. Look across our nation in the last year. We've had active shooting events at Fourth of July parades. We have active shooting events inside of schools, at gay clubs, at shopping centers in houses of worship. We have to be ready for that. You would acknowledge that police need to be trained. They do. <laughs> and they have been, right? So with all of the training that they've been getting, 
for decades upon decades, they are still disproportionately killing black people. They are still choosing when to use restraint and when not to. So I don't know that it's really an issue of the training. Perhaps it's more of an issue of culture. The training site provokes nearly two years of protests in Atlanta, drawing activists from all over the country and inflaming tensions between police and the community even more. On June 5th, more than 300 people packed City Hall for a meeting that lasts more than 16 hours. In the end... The vote is 11 days, 4 days. The motion to adopt as amended carries. Atlanta City Council approves $31 million in taxpayer money for the training center. The funding for the $90 million facility will come from taxpayers and the Atlanta Police Foundation, a nonprofit that wants the training center built. APF receives millions in donations from some of America's biggest companies like Delta, Waffle House, and Home Depot. Construction is expected to begin in August. It does seem interesting, I think, to a lot of folks that in just the span of two or three years um, in this city and around the country, uh, we've gone from defund the police to, you know what, we should build a $90 million training facility for the police. Does that strike you at all as, as, as a bit of a contradiction? So this is a nuanced national conversation. So it's not just about the, the talking points of defunding the police or the talking points of, you know, a, a, a cop city. No, this is about how to make sure that we do safety right. De-escalation tactics, teaching people how to resolve conflict. So we're doing co-responder models versus just police going out there dealing with mental health cases. When we think about policing and we think about prevention of crime, we have to talk about the root causes of crime. And that goes back to unstable housing, insufficient food, lack of employment, lack of education, all of the things that affect people because of wealth inequality. And you can catch Craig's full special, Life, Death, and Cop City, the fight over the future of policing, on NBCNews.com. And still to come, the big headlines trending around the world. The wreck of a cargo ship from, get this, 2,000 years ago was just discovered off the coast of Rome. That's coming up next, so stay tuned. Hey there, thanks for sticking with us. Let's take a quick look around the world in 80 seconds. Today, Singapore just executed the first woman in 19 years, and it's actually their second execution of the week. The woman was sentenced to death back in 2018 for trafficking about an ounce of heroin. Anyone caught with even a half of that amount is automatically sentenced to death in Singapore. And at least one person is dead after a ship carrying thousands of cars caught fire off the Dutch coast. The official cause is still under investigation, but that massive fire is still burning. And a lot of local reports right now are pointing at a battery of an electric car that might have been to blame. The flames are finally cooling down a bit, though, and authorities say they are starting to take control of that ship once again. And the U.S. is telling all non-emergency government employees to get out of Haiti ASAP as gang violence there is getting worse. That call came last night, and Haiti still hasn't elected a new president since the last one was assassinated back in 2021. And this ancient shipwreck was discovered off the coast of Italy. That's it right here. It is 60 feet long, and that ship might be from the first or second century BCE. That's like 2,000 years old. And get this, hundreds of jars on that ship were found intact. No word yet on what they're going to do with that amazing discovery. And the situation in the West African country of Niger is getting more unpredictable by the minute. The soldiers behind a military coup there are now declaring their leader as the head of state. Uh, this latest development comes just days after the group detained the country's democratically elected president in his own home. Then they went on state television saying that the Constitution had been dissolved and the president was no longer in power. NBC's Courtney Kuby has more from the country's capital. Here in Niger, it's day three of what appears to be an attempted coup against the democratically elected president here, General Mohamed Bazoum. Now, he was taken into custody by his own presidential guard services early Wednesday morning. 
Earlier today, it seems that a new leader may be emerging. He is General Chiani, the head of those Presidential Guard services. He took to state-run television today, claiming to, to be the new president of this country. Soon after that, he was seen with a number of different military leaders across the different services, seeming to support his transition of power. Now, it's important to point out that, again, the democratically elected president here has not resigned or relinquished power. He's believed to still be detained by his security services in the presidential palace, U.S. officials telling us that he is believed to be in good health and not being harmed. But again, the U.S. still recognizes him as the leader here in Niger. Now, this attempted coup has been condemned around the world by a number of countries, including those neighboring us here in Niger, calling for calm, calling for President Bazoum to be restored to power and released from his detention. We've seen several days of protests here in Niger, but today, Friday, was relatively calm. We didn't see mass protests. Everyone waiting to see what happens next here in Niger. Courtney Kuby, please stay safe out there. And before we go, it is time for the future of everything. And Walmart seems keen on AI and its stores and warehouses. Plus, it's almost cheesecake day. So we are going to take a stroll back in time with the family who put American cheesecakes on the map. The full story behind the Cheesecake Factory and its gigantic menu. That's coming up. If I don't like it, it doesn't go on the menu. I'm not a gourmet. I don't like a lot of things. But what I like, millions of people like, thank goodness. <laughs> And the future of work is a conversation that seems to be changing every single day. How jobs are done, how they're already looking very different with AI, and whether artificial intelligence puts a lot of those jobs at risk. So NBC's Jake Ward went straight to Walmart, the nation's biggest private employer, to get a closer look. Walmart has always been the standard bearer for efficiency, with 1.6 million associates across the country. It's also the largest private employer in the United States. And that means when its CEO says that it's going to grow revenue 4% every year and that two-thirds of the stores are going to involve automation of some form, well, it says a lot about the future of labor in the United States and in the era of AI. Once upon a time, Jose Avila had had an incredible when you memory. Started, were you supposed to have memorized where everything is? Uh, yes. And great shoes. So I would have to actually take them to the items that they needed, so from one end to the store to the other. But today, an AI-powered app shows where everything is and needs to go. It's making my job much easier. Walmart is already a cost-cutting machine, and yet the company wants to be even more streamlined. Sanjay Radhakrishnan is in charge of making that happen. How can you possibly grow more efficient than you currently are? Jacob, that's where I think technology will pl uh, play a key enabling role. We are transforming our supply chain and our store operations. And as we saw in this California superstore, AI is how they plan to do it. When trucks arrive to be offloaded, AI has already organized the pallets inside. It looks disorganized to me. But if I understand correctly, AI is telling you through the phone where everything is and where it should go. Yes, we'll have to open up our camera right. and hold up our work device, and then it's going to tell us what boxes need to go out. Sensors in every aisle spot things as small as a freezer door left open. And AI even arranges the shelves. Then we can learn and say, OK, did two facings of this do better than maybe putting another brand in there oh, or wow. another flavor in there, right? Walmart is the nation's largest private employer. And what they decide to do when it comes to efficiency sets national standards. So when they decide to adopt AI, it has implications for the whole country. And that, of course, raises a crucial question for workers. Does AI, do you think, forecast a world in which you won't need as many humans in this store? We view technology as helping our associates to evolve physically demanding jobs into more fulfilling, higher-skilled job roles. So over time, we believe 
that we'll be about the same or more number of associates in the company. As a retail worker, can I sort of relax about my job in the future, do you think? No, I, uh, I don't think that you can. Experts say the number of jobs may remain the same, but people without the right skills won't get them. There are increasing uh, frictions in the workplace such that it is harder for workers to transition from one job to a new job. Avila, the store lead, says workers here are happier in the age of AI. Our headcount and our turnover is much better from two years ago. Mm. Yeah, oh. much better. Now we'll see how working in a world of low prices and high efficiency compares to shopping in one. Now, a new Pew Research study has just come out that shows that roughly one-fifth, about 19% of jobs in the United States, are directly exposed to AI when it comes to losing your job to a computer. What's interesting is that it projects that mostly higher-educated, higher-paying jobs are the ones that are most likely. And here's the weird part. The people in those kinds of jobs are the most likely to say that they do not think they'll be replaced by AI, just that AI will help them in their jobs. And so not only are those people most exposed to being replaced by AI, they may be the most deluded about its future in their life. Back to you. Uh, such a sign of the times there. Jake Ward, thanks so much. And finally, guess what Sunday is? Sunday is National Cheesecake Day. And what better way to prepare than to head over to the first cheesecake factory ever right here in Los Angeles for a slice or two or maybe five of delicious cheesecake and a bit of history that all started with a Detroit mom making cheesecake in her basement and her son then moved out west and found the perfect place to start selling those cakes. My mother... She wasn't really a professional baker, but she uh, got a recipe out of the newspaper. Uh, she said she changed it, and we're not sure she really did, but uh, everyone loved this cheesecake. In 1940s Detroit, Michigan, the Cheesecake Factory Empire was born in Evelyn Overton's basement. My whole life was built around this cheesecake. I used to get a penny a box for folding boxes so she could uh, use them. Uh, for her delivery. Evelyn's son David is the Cheesecake Factory CEO and chairman of the board. And I never liked cheesecake growing up. No way, really? But when, as I got older, I ended up liking it. After years of bacon cheesecakes for restaurants, Evelyn and her husband Oscar still dreamed of having their own business. So you were the pioneer that came out west. I was the one for sure. In 1972, David was a student and a musician in California. And he convinced his parents to sell everything and move to Los Angeles to open a bakery with their life savings. And they called it the Cheesecake Factory. They used to get up at 5 a.m., start making cheesecakes, uh, go for dinner, come back, put another batch in the oven. This is the true American success story because you take two people that were not professional bakers, really had no money, and put their heart and soul into a business and built it into what it is today. Six years later, David decided to build a restaurant around his mother's cheesecakes. This is where it all started. Absolutely, it's in the exact same spot, the exact same kitchen. And I knew nothing about the tricks of the trade. I knew nothing about steam tables. I didn't even have French fries for two years because I didn't know how to work a fryer. <laughs> I had hash browns. The original menu featured simple foods that David liked to eat. I'm looking here at these prices. Super Factory yeah. Burger, $2.40. Yeah. Cheesecake, $1.25. Wow! Right. It was a runaway success. Every day there was a line, every lunch, every dinner. One restaurant became two, then five, then one more every year. And in 1992, Cheesecake Factory became a publicly traded company. Then there's that menu. 250 menu items. I imagine that's like... Uh, that's you gotta almost, be crazy. Do you ever think that's... Uh, that's uh, maybe we can do more with less? It could be a little smaller, but because our sales are so great, I think it's because of the menu. And some definite fan favorites. You know, avocado egg rolls and Thai lettuce wraps and macaroni cheese balls, chicken Madeira. All coming in giant portions that usually require a doggy bag. I said, okay, I'm never going to nickel and dime anybody. Okay. Now, cooks in every Cheesecake Factory start their day with 700 ingredients Chop salad to go. and 160 sauces and dressings. And David still does weekly taste tests. That's perfect. If I don't like it, it doesn't go on the menu. I'm not a gourmet. I don't like a lot of things, but what I like, millions of people like, thank goodness. 
The original restaurant opened with 12 cheesecake varieties, and today there are more than 30. Evelyn's Mixer is enshrined at the company headquarters. Wow, wow, wow. And of course, what's a visit to Cheesecake Factory without sampling the goods? This is really the, the formula that started it all, my mother's original cheesecake. David says his mother's recipes and the restaurants will always be one of a kind. There are no cheesecake clones. Why? Because it's just too darn hard. <laughs> but we do it, and we do it well. Here we go again. I mean, I love my job. <laughs> that last one that you saw, that was the one that they just unveiled, this brand new cheesecake over there. You know how the bottom of the cheesecake is graham crackers? Well, the top layer on this one is pure cookie dough. It is so good. That does it for us tonight. I'm Gotti Schwartz. We'll see you on Monday. But until then, happy Cheesecake Day on Sunday. See you later. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.